Today I'm telling the story of a woman who was a prayer warrior. She was so in tune with God and the Holy Spirit that God was able to lead her out of captivity, crossing multiple states on foot. God showed her the way to lead others out of captivity. She was the first woman to lead a military force where she freed 700 men being held captive. She worked as a spy during the Civil War. She even had brain surgery without any anesthesia. And she was a speaker who recruited hundreds of people to fight for freedom. And she worked with the movement to try to get women the right to vote. She was even in New York for the dedication of the Statue of Liberty. Let's hear her amazing story. Welcome back to Church History. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. Today we are telling the story of a woman that many people have heard of. However, often her faith is left out of the story when it's being told, even though her faith was the essence of her story. The year was 1820. The United States population was 9,638,453. 18.4% of those were African Americans. Just five years before this, Napoleon Bonaparte met his Waterloo. His surrender ended his reign. And just four years before this had been the summer that never happened. The year spring ended, and then winter returned and stayed until the next year. That was because of a volcano that had sent so much ash into the atmosphere that Europe and America had no summer, creating a famine and Many preachers began preaching that the end of the world was coming. This was the year that the Missouri Compromise passed, which allowed Missouri to join the United States despite still being a slave state. It was also the year Maine was admitted as the 23rd state of the Union. Somewhere between 1820 and 1825, a little girl was born to two slaves, Harriet Green and Ben Ross. Harriet's mother, Modesty, had arrived in America by a slave ship coming to America. Modesty gave birth to her daughter, Harriet, and most historians believe she was impregnated by her owner. Harriet was born into slavery and probably owned by her biological father. She worked as a cook in the home. She married Ben, who worked on the Thompson Plantation as a woodsman. Harriet and Ben had nine children even though they lived and worked on different plantations. Their children were Lina, Miria, Riddy, Soph, Robert, Ben, Rachel, Henry, Moses, and Minty. Minty is the baby in our story. Minty, along with her siblings, were born into slavery. They were owned by Mary Pattison Broadress, whose husband was probably their grandfather. Mary wrote in her will that the children were to be made free after her death. Mary had a son named Edward. Minty and Edward grew up in the house together. When Edward was sick as a child, Minty helped take care of him and prayed for his healing. Harriet and Ben raised their children to love and honor God. They prayed for slavery to end and for freedom to come. While the family were all Christian, little Minty found great power in prayer and felt God's presence was with her. When Minty was a small child, less than five years old, John Quincy Adams became the president. He was the only founding father who didn't own slaves, and he wanted to end slavery in America. His presidential win was controversial. No one was actually sure who had won, and Congress eventually voted to have him installed. Four years later, he lost the next election, and Andrew Jackson became the president. John Quincy Adams did not retire quietly as a former president. He stayed in politics and served in Congress, fighting for the end of slavery. He was the only president to work in Congress after being president. A group of people fighting to end slavery realized no political party was going to do anything to end slavery. The Whig Party said they were opposed to slavery, and they did stand up against the Democrat Party, who was fighting to keep slavery. But the Whig Party kept making compromises and trying to work with the Democrats. Those opposed to slavery realized they needed a new party, and the Republican Party was created with the goal to end slavery. Around the age of 10, Minty saw a runaway slave. Her master was angry and threw a large metal weight at the slave. He missed and hit Minty in the head. 
She was unconscious for days and in bed for months after. She started to have seizures, and these seizures continued for the rest of her life. While in recovery, Minty spent a lot of time in prayer, and she began to have visions. These visions also lasted for the rest of her life. She believed these were visions from God. She spoke to God in prayer as if God was standing right next to her, and she trusted whatever she felt God was telling her. In 1833, when Minty would have been around 13 years old, William Wilberforce died in England. Just before his death, slavery was abolished in all of the British governed land, including Canada. We did three episodes on the life of William Wilberforce, and I definitely recommend going back and listening to them. When Minty was an older teen, or perhaps early 20s, her father was made a free man. It's now 1840s. William Henry Harrison is president, but only for a month before he died from an illness. There is the Battle of the Alamo that inspired a nation. In England, the Scotland Yard created the first official police unit, and Ireland was in the middle of the worst famine, sending many Irish to America looking for hope. And Minty, still living on a plantation as a slave, met a free man named John Tubman. They fell in love and were married. John wanted to find a way to free Minty. He hired a lawyer to find a way to help Minty become a free woman. The lawyer discovered that Minty and her siblings were already supposed to be free. They had been willed to the family, but under the requirements that they would become free as adults. They were being held as slaves against the law. But even when confronted with this knowledge, Mr. Bodice refused to allow Minty and her family to leave, and he banned John from the property. One day, while working, Minty had a vision of her sisters being taken from her. The very next day, her master sold her sisters, and they were taken to a plantation in another state. Minty prayed to God. She told God, You know that my master is evil, and God, if you cannot change his heart, then please let him die. A few days later, Mr. Broderest became ill and died, leaving his son Edward as the master of the home. Edward and Minty had grown up almost like siblings, but Minty refused to show Edward any respect. She knew she was not a slave and was supposed to legally be free. This was the year gold was discovered in California, and people were leaving the South, running to California, looking for gold. The gold rush was officially on. But for Minty, she was still just trying to find a way to be free. While she was working, she had a vision from God. She saw Edward making plans to sell her. She heard God tell her that she had to run, and she had to run at that moment. There was no time to wait, no time to get word to her husband. She had to run. It was September the 17th. Minty and her brothers decided to run. However, before they left the plantation, her brothers became too afraid and returned, leaving Minty to run on her own. She traveled 90 miles, running at night, hiding during the day. She found people who were willing to help her and take her, giving her rides at some point. She prayed the entire time. She asked God specifically what paths to take and who to trust. She listened to what she felt God was telling her, and God led her. Finally, she arrived in Pennsylvania, a free state. There she met the people who were running the Underground Railroad. They told her she was now a free woman. She could make choices for herself. And the first choice she could make for herself was her name. She could pick her own name, a free name. She chose the name Harriet Tubman, Harriet after her mother, and Tubman, the last name of her husband. The society helped her find a place to live and helped her find work. She found a job cleaning and cooking. She was getting paid now and she was free, but she was not happy. She had not been able to say goodbye to her husband and her sisters had been sold and she was sure her brothers had probably been beaten because she had run. She cried every day, missing her family and worrying about them. God was all she had. She prayed day and night and listened to God's voice. She knew she was not happy and not content because God had something planned for her. All she had to do at this point, though, was to wait for God to tell her when it was time and she would trust him. November 1846, John Quincy Adams was speaking in Congress when he passed out. He died a few days later. 
There was a young, new congressman in the House of Representatives who was very shook up at the death of Mr. Adams. He had heard many of his speeches on the need to free the slaves. This young congressman decided he would take up the banner of Mr. Adams and continue his work. The young man's name was Abraham Lincoln. Harriet Tubman was now a free woman still working and praying that God would use her for something great. Then in 1850, the worst happened. The Fugitive Slave Law was passed. This was an example of the Whig Party trying to work alongside the Democrat Party and make compromises. The compromises meant the free men and women could be returned to their plantations. This made it law that all slaves had to be returned. Slaves who were living in free states could be taken by their masters and sent back to plantations. The Underground Railroad that had been working to bring slaves to free states now had to find a way to get all of the slaves still in captivity and the ones in the free states all the way to Canada. This seemed impossible. Harriet would not leave for Canada without her family. She decided to return, get her family, and bring them with her. She left alone and walked all the way back to the Broadus Plantation, where Edward was still running the plantation. He had run it so poorly that the family was now almost bankrupt. The only thing Edward owned of any value was the land and the male slaves, who were Harriet's brothers. She arrived on the plantation and told her brothers they had to leave immediately. There was no time to pack anything, no time to say goodbye. They had to follow her and follow her now. But her brothers were now married, and they said they would not leave without their wives and children. Harriet planned on taking only a few men, but now she had families. She found her husband, John Tubman. She was expecting a happy reunion and for him to go with her. But John had thought that Harriet had died, and he had remarried a woman named Caroline. They were expecting a baby, and Caroline could not travel, and John didn't want to leave her, so Harriet had to leave her husband behind. She took her brothers, sister-in-laws, nieces, and made the impossible journey. Harriet did it the same way she had done when she escaped. With each path, with each choice, she prayed, and she let God lead them to freedom. The family made it all the way to Canada. She bought a house on North Street in St. Catharines, Ontario, but God told her he was not done. Throughout the South, Christian men and women were on their knees praying and asking God to free them. They would pray what they called pot prayers. They believed there was power in prayers that were said out loud, but they didn't want their masters to hear their prayers. So they would pray into a pot, saying the prayers out loud into the pot, while the other slaves sang around them. This way, the masters did not hear their prayers, but God did. God would lead them to freedom, but he needed a Moses, someone who would listen to him, someone so in tune with the Holy Spirit that they could feel even the gentlest nudge of the Holy Spirit. Harriet Tubman was that woman, working out of her home on North Street in St. Catharines, Ontario, she journeyed by foot, horse, and carriage back to Southern America, finding slaves willing to run and bringing them to Ontario, Canada with her. Then she would return back to the South for more slaves. The plantation owners were angry. Some believed it was a white man painting his face black and dressing as a woman. No one knew who she was, but the slaves and the masters all began to call her Moses. Are you enjoying this podcast? Do you want to support this podcast? Well, pour yourself a cup of coffee and imagine waking up each morning with a reminder from our church fathers. Check out our Etsy page where you can find mugs with quotes from great men and women of God. You'll find a link in the show notes. And now back to our episode. In 1858, Harriet met a man named John Brown. John was part of the abolitionist movement. While Harriet's activism involved taking slaves from their plantation and bringing them to freedom, John believed the only way slavery would end would be with a war. Remember, by this point, slavery had been outlawed in the British Empire for 25 years. The abolitionist movement in America 
had been active since 1831. It officially started when Lloyd Garrison had published his first abolitionist paper, 27 years of writing papers and giving speeches. The Republican Party had been started in 1854. The pacifist movement had been trying to end slavery without violence for almost 30 years. John believed it was time to demand slavery ended. He believed both slave owners and the politicians who were allowing slavery to continue needed to be held accountable. John started out as a pacifist. He worked in the cattle business and his family was part of the Underground Railroad. But in 1837, his friend Elijah Lovejoy was brutally murdered for speaking out against slavery. Elijah was a Presbyterian minister. When John heard of the murder of his friend, he vowed he would end slavery. He said, Here, before God, in the presence of these witnesses, from this time I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. By 1855, his children were grown and had families of their own. They lived in an area that would eventually become the state of Kansas. John's sons were fighting to have Kansas added as a free state. John moved to the area to help his sons with the fight. There was a group of pro-slavery people who opposed John and his group. They attacked the abolitionist movement. John decided they would counter-attack. May 25, 1856, John led men to attack the group that had first attacked them. This led to the death of five pro-slavery men. The death of these five men started a war in Kansas. The pro-slavery movement vowed they would kill John and his whole family. They took all three of his sons, beat them, and one of his sons was killed. John traveled all around, speaking and telling his story and recruiting more people to his movement. The pacifist time was over. It was time to fight for freedom. Harriet began to work with John at this time, and John gave her the nickname General Tubman. She began to recruit men to help John. In 1858, Kansas officially became a state, and it was a free state with no slavery. While it was officially a free state with no slavery, slave owners did not allow their slaves to be free. John kept working to free those who were still being held as slaves. He created military movements that would raid plantations in the area that were still continuing to hold slaves. They would come onto the plantation, take the slaves, and then leave, bringing them to freedom. Many of the men who were freed then became part of his military group. October 16, 1859, the group raided land owned by a man named Colonel Lewis Washington. Now, the family was really well known because they were related to George Washington, the first president of the United States. So they were a family really, really well known. John's group kidnapped Lewis Washington. They also raided an area where the pro-slavery group was keeping all of their weapons. One of the men in the group shot and killed a free black man who refused to help John, and this was the first death in the raid. They shot him in the back. A full war battle broke out. John's group was forced into a smaller building, and eventually John was forced to surrender because President Buchanan sent Robert E. Lee to attack the group. They were outnumbered. One of John's sons was killed during the raid. Brown was convicted and executed on December the 2nd, 1859. The Democrats wanted to make sure the abolitionist movement knew they would never win, and many came to watch the execution of John Brown. One of the Democrats who came to watch the execution was an actor named John Wills Booth. Do you love learning about church history and love this podcast? This podcast is being turned into a book series and the first book is now available for sale. You can find the link in the show notes. And now back to our episode. The year is now 1859. Harriet was introduced to the abolitionist and U.S. Senator named William H. Sewald. He had a home in New York City, and he sold it to Harriet for $1,200. This home in New York is where she lived for the rest of her life. A year later, Harriet finally heard word of where her sister was. She immediately started the journey to bring her to freedom. When she finally arrived at the plantation where her sister had been held, she was saddened to learn her sister had died. She wondered 
why God had sent her all this way if her sister was already dead. Another family on the plantation named the Annals asked her to take them to freedom. Harriet realized God had sent her to answer the prayers of her sister, which was to bring her friends to freedom. This was the last family Harriet brought to freedom through one of her trips. A few months later, the young congressman who had taken the mantle of John Quincy Adams became the president, Abraham Lincoln, the first Republican president. And slavery was the hot issue and tensions were high. A year later, the Civil War started. Harriet Tubman began to work with a man named General David Hunter. General Hunter created a regiment of soldiers who were all African American, many of them former slaves. Harriet wanted to be part of the regiment, so she signed up to work as a spy. She was sent to South Carolina to work as a cook and a nurse. She worked as both a spy and a recruiter. She found male slaves willing to run away and join General Hunter's regiment, and she helped them escape. One day, Harriet learned of a place where 700 black men were being held as captives. She personally led a military group and became the first woman in America to lead a military assault. Her team rescued all 700 men, and most of them joined General Hunter's regiment. January the 1st, 1863, Harriet is around 40 years old, and Abraham Lincoln declared the Emancipation Proclamation. God had answered the prayers of the men and women praying into their pots. Freedom had come. In 1865, the Civil War ended and Harriet Tubman returned to her home in New York. Her work of leading slaves to freedom was finished. The actor who witnessed the execution of John Brown was not ready to admit defeat. April 1865, John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln while he watched a play. The year is 1869. In a Presbyterian church, Harriet Tubman is standing at the front of the church, dressed in white. Standing across from her is a man named Nelson Davis. They are standing before God and the church, vowing to love, honor, and cherish each other till death do them part. Harriet had freedom and the life she had always dreamed of, and now she had a family. A woman named Sarah Bradford wrote a book about Harriet and paid her $1,200. A year later, a Mississippi black man named Hiram Rhodes Revels joined the Republican Party and ran for Congress. He won and became the first black man in Congress. Harriet and Nelson Davis were newlyweds, living as free people in New York, witnessing a black man from the South in Congress. I can't imagine what that must have felt like for them. Harriet could not have children because she had married too late in life. So Harriet and Nelson adopted a little girl named Gertie. She loved being a mom and dedicated the next two decades of her life to being a great mom. The world seemed to change overnight. In 1877, the first telephone line was run and the White House got its own telephone. Yellowstone National Park was opened as the first national park and Grant, who led the North to victory in the Civil War, became the president. Sarah Bradford wrote a second book on the life of Harriet and once again paid her for a story. The book is called Harriet, Moses of Her People. This second book became the biography most historians use to learn her story. The Brooklyn Bridge opened on May 24, 1883. There were rumors that the bridge would not be able to hold all the crowds of people who were coming. People were excited to visit the bridge, and the crowds were really large. Some people slipped and fell and screamed. The rumor spread quickly that the scream was the bridge collapsing which caused more people to scream, which made the rumor grow faster. People panicked and tried to get off the bridge, causing a stampede and killing people. In 1883, newspapers were all telling the story of a volcano eruption in Indonesia that killed 10,000 people. A few years later, another tragedy hit, this time in Pennsylvania, the state Harriet had lived in when she had first run for freedom. A dam broke and the town of Johnson was completely destroyed, killing whole families and entire communities. Then, on October 28, 1886, the Statue of Liberty was officially dedicated. 
For the young family living in New York, the world was changing all around them. Telephone lines, African-American men in Congress, the Brooklyn Bridge. The world had changed so much since her birth on the plantation. When Harriet was in her 60s, her husband Nelson Davis died, leaving Harriet as a single mother to Gertie, who was a teenager at this point. Once Gertie was grown and Harriet was in her 70s, she realized she was not done. She still had work to do. She began to speak and work with the women's suffrage, who were working to get the right for women to vote. She began to struggle at night with sleeping, and she was told she was going to need brain surgery. Harriet was afraid of anesthesia, and she refused to accept it, and asked instead for a bullet to bite on. In her 70s, she had brain surgery totally awake. In 1896, the first modern Olympic Games were held in Greece. Harriet was 76 years old. She began to see a new problem. Many former slaves were now elderly. They didn't have any place to go. Many didn't have a family. They had been freed late in life. They had never found their children or their siblings, and they didn't have jobs that allowed them to earn enough money to save for the elderly years. Harriet felt God telling her he had given her his home as a blessing, and she should bless others. She turned her house into a retirement home for elderly black men and women. It was officially opened in 1908, and she was in her late 80s. At the age of 93, in the year 1913, in her home in New York, Harriet Tubman passed away from pneumonia. As she was nearing death, she spoke about heaven, and she began to quote verses from heaven. She quoted John chapter 14, verses 2 to 3. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and welcome you into my presence, so that you also may be where I am. Those were her last words. She died in 1913. During the transatlantic slave trade, 10.7 million men, women, and children were taken and shipped to new lands. Of those 10.7 million, 388,000 landed in America, which is actually a very small percentage. Those 388,000 people were brought to America as slaves. In the Civil War, 620,000 men were killed, 360,222 Union soldiers, and 258,000 Confederate soldiers. God did hear the cries and prayers of women such as Harriet, and America did pay the price. The sons, grandsons of those who brought the slaves to America were killed. The number of deaths from the battlefield almost doubled the number of slaves who were brought to America. One of the men killed on the battleground was Edward, the man who had grown up in the home with Harriet and then become her master. Next week, I'm going to tell more stories of what the church was doing in America during the 1800s. For more podcasts, blogs, and videos, you can check out my website, lauraleesiemens.com, and I'll see you next week.